don't even know where to start, mate. <laughs> I've had an amazing career. Mo Farah, Olympic gold number four. I have achieved everything I ever dreamed of. Mo Farah. Britain's greatest ever athletics Olympian. But there's something about me you don't know. It's a secret that I've been hiding since I was a child. Because you came to the UK from Somalia when you yeah. were eight? Eight years old, yeah. And to me, even to face it and talk about the facts, how it happened, why it happened, it's tough. The truth is, I'm not who you think I am. And now, whatever the cost, I need to tell my real story. Hussein, dinner Where time. are you, Hussein? Come on, it's your favourite. Come on, it's time for dinner. Family means everything to me, and you know, as a parent, you always teach your kids to be honest. But I feel like I've always had that private thing where I can never be me or tell what's really happened. I've been keeping this for so long. It's been difficult because you don't want to face it. And often my kids ask questions. Dad, how comes this? And you always got an answer for everything. But you haven't got an answer for that. That's the main reason I'm telling my story, because I want to feel normal. I don't feel like you're holding on to something. I first met Mo in school. He was always smiling. That's what stood out about Mo, is amongst the groups of grumpy teenagers. Mo was always happy-go-lucky. We were engaged by 2009, and it was during that period of time, sort of the year leading up to us being married, that I felt like there was lots of missing pieces to his story. Behind the smile, there was something there, and that's when I started to ask questions. So this is the autobiography of Mo's life. The story in here, which is the story I always knew of Mo growing up, was that he was born in Mogadishu, Somalia, and at the age of about eight or nine, he came to the UK with his mum and two of his brothers to live with his father. That was the story that you believed to be true? Yeah, until I found out otherwise. I didn't know much about his parents at the time and I'd never seen them or heard him talk about them. It wasn't until I think I'd, I'd worn him down, really, with all the questioning that he, he eventually just said, look, that, that's not how it happened. It was hard for me to tell her because I never really talk about it. It's more back of my mind and it's been for years. <laughs> he just sort of matter-of-factly told me this is really what happened. And I just, I was gobsmacked. Most people know me as Mo Farah, but it's not my name or it's not the reality. The real story is I was born in Somaliland, north of Somalia, as Hussein Abdi Kahin. Despite what I've said in the past, my parents never lived in the UK. When I was four, my dad was killed in a civil war. You know, as a family, we were torn apart. I was separated from my mother, and I was brought into the UK illegally under the name of another child called Mohammed Farah. This is the visa document. Yeah, this is the, the visa to come to the UK, and, and this was the document we came with. You would have been nine, you hadn't turned 10, ten yet. yet. Yeah, that is my photo, but it's not my name. From that moment, coming in, it was a different name and different identity. I know I've taken someone else's place, but... And I, I do wonder what is Mohammed doing now? And in the picture here, it was the lady who brought me into the UK. So this woman wasn't your mother? No. On paper, it's my mum, but it's not really my mum. I don't think we ever really have gotten to the bottom of why she brought you here. 
That to me is the $64,000 question. For me, for years, just keep blocking it out, blocking it out. And you can only block it out for so much. Now, I'm just piecing everything together, taking myself back to that moment in Africa. I was nine years old. I thought I was going out to Europe to live with relatives. I remember getting on a plane with this lady. She's got two kids. I'm like, I'm excited, because I've never been on a plane before. So we got off the plane with the woman and her kids. I'm going around, looking around, just amazed. We go through passport check and the lady going, yeah, don't forget Mohammed, Mohammed. I was like, yeah, Mohammed, Mohammed. Because that was on the document. Stamp. Go through. On the other side, she says to me, don't say anything. Don't talk. This is your name. That's it. We see this man standing, just looking around. In Somalia, I can understand clear. Where's Mohammed? Where is he? He was her husband, and their family name was Farah. He was waiting for them and his oldest son, Mohammed. That's when I realized I had taken Mohammed's place. She talks to him. Don't know what she said to him. But at that point, we get in the car. I had all the contact details from my relative. And once we got to the house, the lady took it off me and right in front of me, ripped them up and put it in the bin. And at that moment, I knew I was in trouble. I've been scared to go back to my old house for many, many years. I've never taken that route. I often drive past it on the motorway where you can see on the other side and you go, oh, I used to live in them flats. Not great memories. So this is the road here. So number five would have been just there in the middle. So that's the living room. And I spent hours and hours in that room. When the man was around, I was treated very differently. But he was never there or working or something. Often we wouldn't see him for weeks. But from day one, the lady, what she did wasn't right. I wasn't treated as part of the family. I was always that kid who did everything. I don't know, more someone like who works for you, who's just, you know, that's your space, that's our space, this is what you do. If I wanted food in my mouth, my job was to look after those kids, shower them, cook for them, clean for them. And she said, if you ever want to see your family again, don't say anything. If you say anything, they will take you away. Often I would just lock myself in the bathroom and cry and Nobody's there to help, so after a while I just, you know, learn not to have that emotion. And I remember just putting up with everything that she ever said. The anger and just the screaming. I told myself one day I will see my real family. That's what was going through my mind and kept telling myself day and day again, I will see them one day. I wanted to go to school. She was like, no, you can't, it's not time yet. You can't leave the house. I want to go, no, you can't. Eventually, she let me go and end up going to Felton Community College, it was called. That was year seven. Oh. We both went to Felton School. Oh, God. Felton was predominantly white. 
I would say it was a very small minority of us that were either non-white or mixed. Going to school was always difficult for me. My English wasn't great. It's such a big shock in terms of having different culture. Often you don't even know what should I say, what do I need to say, how should I behave. So I did struggle. When Mo came to the school, we had very confused messages about his past. We were having meeting after meeting, trying to discover and work out exactly what his background was. Mohammed is a refugee from Somalia who arrived in this country in November 93. The school report that Mohammed is experiencing difficulties in all areas of the curriculum. Mohammed is disruptive in most lessons and can become involved in fights in the classroom. And this is the Hounsa language service. Parents, country of origin, Somalia. Mohammed lives with his mother, who is not an English speaker. Parents separated. Father living nearby. No phone at home. As time went on, we had incredible behavior difficulties with Mo across the school, and we needed to speak to somebody. Mo's family never turned up. He was coming into school, he was unkempt, he was uncared for, and we were more and more worried that the family wasn't as it should be, and in fact, Mo was not being supported in the right way when he was at home. Parents not attending meetings with head of year, emotionally and culturally alienated. There is a feeling of frustration and isolation about him. I feel sad when I'm with him. If I asked Mo to explain to me what was going on or where his parents were, why hadn't they come in, he would say that they were busy. He was very quick to change the subject. He would also pretend not to understand. It was very difficult to get a coherent answer from him about anything that was going on in the home. Often I never talk about anything because I couldn't. I was scared what will happen later on. So she told you don't talk about anything? Anything. Otherwise she I was in big trouble. And I guess for me, only things that I could do in my control to run away from this was get out and run. When I first met Mo, he had very, very little English, and the only language he really seemed to understand was the language of PE and sport. Mo was a particularly good sportsman, that was obvious. We put him in a race and he won it. We put him in another race and he won it, and every race we put him in, he pretty much always won, and then started winning them by a long distance, so that wasn't difficult to spot. The fact that he was doing so well in his sport, I would talk to teachers about that. I would talk to his former teacher, Sarah Rennie, and to other people that could really support him. He's not just the boy that you see that's getting involved in fights. He's not just the boy that you see in your lesson that doesn't appear to be taking any notice. He's actually you know, got quite a little bit more to him than that. As a kid, you just know who's good and not. It's your instinct. Alan, I just feel like that trust, because of often I think I saw him as as well as a PE teacher, as someone who's really, generally, does care. He was inviting me to, you know, to go to the running club, join the athletics club, and encouraging me and me making up all these excuses, saying, I can't do it. I couldn't do it for a reason, but I couldn't stay. I had to go back home straight. It got to a point where it was like I needed to tell somebody what I was going through. I needed help. Mo came to see me with another student from Somalia who spoke very good English, and they came into the changing room. We just finished PE. Um, I think once we finished the game, the changing room cleared up. They were being quite serious, you know, normally very, very jolly. I was scared, but I couldn't go back there. And I couldn't go up with this anymore. And that's the point. And I told him everything. Mo told me he wasn't the son of um, the person that he was living with, that he'd been brought over to do all the jobs, look after the smaller children. He also 
then explained that actually his name wasn't Mohammed Farah. He was removed from his family, that he was given a new identity and brought over here to do jobs and chores. That was obviously quite a, a shocking revelation to hear. I just had to do something, I don't know. I just had to get out. Whatever way I could get out, I had to get out. The next day I took what he'd said to the senior leadership at the school. I think Mo thought that a magic wand would be waved and he turned up at school basically with all of his belongings, uh, expecting that he was going to be moved. So I had to explain to him that that wasn't the case. The next step would be that social services would be contacted. Well, I told the social workers, my name is not Mo, my name is Hussein. I have family somewhere, but I don't have any contact. And I didn't know whether they were alive or not. That was, that was the hardest thing. But to be honest, I was not concerned about name or anything. I was more concerned about my own safety and me being free. And I remember going, OK, just take me somewhere. Take me somewhere. Somebody else in the Somalian community who had a child at the school offered to take Mo in. Uh, and that offer was, was waved through by, by social services. It was my friend's mum, Kinsey. She really took care of me and I was happy there. And then I stayed for a couple of days, weeks, months, ended up staying seven years. <laughs> I still miss my real family, but from that moment, everything got better. I felt like a lot of stuff was lifted over my shoulders and I felt like me, and that's when Mo came out, the real Mo, just being free. From that point on, he was Mohammed Farah. Nobody addressed what he had said in, in terms of his identity, and Mo just became, <laughs> just became Mo. It was just a remarkable transformation. We had good runners before, we'd had good athletes before, but the progress from there was just stratospheric. And what's your name? Mohammed Farah. Mohammed Farah. What's your ambitions? Olympics? Yeah. Imagine it. He started to win national races by 30 seconds to a minute and... Come on, Mohammed! You could see that it was effortless. Mo definitely stood out as a rising star. That's the winner of the 3,000 metres, Mohammed Farah. He was winning every race that he took part in. Whether it was at school for the borough or at the English schools, he would always make winning look easy. At the age of 14, Mo was selected to compete for English schools in Latvia. And it wasn't really very clear what Mo's immigration status was. You know, he didn't have the documentation that he would need to travel. So we started that process of getting him uh, the British citizenship as Mohammed Farah. There are a range of comprehensive measures that look at border force or powers as well to deter illegal entry to the United Kingdom. I remember being excited to represent your country and not being able to compete was hard because it felt like, you know, you got to that position and now, you know, you can't do it because you don't have paperwork. Now I've decided to, you know, come forward and to tell the truth. I need to understand how I got my citizenship. And Alan kept lots of documents. This is the box, man. There's loads of stuff in here. There's loads of papers about your citizenship. We just bombarded them with communication about this. Getting Mo to the point where, you know, he had his British citizenship was quite a long process. It involved a couple of trips to the Home Office, lots of letters and form filling. Then writing to you concerning a pupil we have at school. His name is Mohammed Farah and he's an asylum seeker from Somalia. We'd very much like him to obtain his British citizenship so that he can run in the World Athletics Championships and represent Great Britain. I wouldn't even read any of this. I didn't know how much process went in. I just remember at that moment, I want to compete, I want to compete, and I just didn't think. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a lot of, there was a lot going on in the background. 
It was three or four years after he had made the disclosure to me that his identity wasn't Mohammed Farah. And by that point, nobody was thinking back to the time he'd come over with a different identity. You know, he was, he was Mo. And so on the 25th of July in 2000, you got that letter, which says, we're pleased to enclose a certificate of registration as a British citizen. That's the document that showed that you are Mohammed Farah and, and known as Mohammed Farah in, in this country. Yeah, 25th of July 2000, that was the date. But uh, honestly, for me, it's been years of just back of your mind, back of your mind, and I think taking this step, the last thing I want to do in terms of being honest is cause a problem for you. I don't even know what's going to happen. That's, that's, no. that's... No, I mean, I, you told me the school knew about it, everybody knew about it, but when you went through the process of social services, you stayed as Mohammed Farah. To my mind, at that point, the state had recognised you as, as Mohammed Farah. It's only recently, really, that I've thought about it and questioned whether actually I did anything wrong in this scenario. But, but when I think back, I don't think either I or the school did do anything wrong. You were Mohammed Farah. I always wonder, how did I get to that position or how, how did this happen? I guess I wasn't meant to be here. How did I end up being here? Yeah, I know what, the thing that just, just strikes me is the year before you came to school, I taught another boy called Mohammed Farah. No, you didn't. There's another boy called Mohammed Farah at the school, and he was there for about a couple of months at most, and he just disappeared. Gone. Nobody knew what had happened to him or where, where he went. But you know, thinking back now and thinking about your story, was there any connection Probably. at all between that Mohammed Farah um, and and your circumstances? Oh, now he got me thinking and going. Where's that boy? What is he doing? Has he got family? Has he got kids? Is he alive? What is he doing? I often think about the other Mohammed Farah, the boy whose place I took on that plane, and I really hope he's OK. Wherever he is, I carry his name, and that could cause problems now for me and my family. The important thing is for me to just be able to look, this is what's happened and, and uh, just being honest, really. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. hi. Tanya. Yes. I'm Alan Bradark. Mo. Hi, Mo. Oh, hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. You too. Thanks. Right, grab a seat. Yep. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for coming in today. Um, so obviously we want to take you both through the advice. And it's just in relation to the risk you know, to your British nationality status, so you're entirely clear on what it means to publicly reveal um, how you acquired your British nationality. From what we have seen, the application for your nationality, uh, when it was made, there were false representations made in that application, which means essentially that your nationality was obtained by fraud or misrepresentations. Um, there is a power in law, therefore, to take away your, na your, British, your British nationality. OK. Well, but yeah. when I first went to the social workers, did it not trigger anything or did something not come up at all? Unfortunately, nothing was passed to any relevant authorities that would have decided your immigration application, so it was completely not known to the Home Office. That's where the danger of, of, of them taking away your citizenship comes from. Surely there would have still been a protocol back then for a child who has been taken unwillingly from one country to another. Yeah, absolutely. Basically, the definition of trafficking is transportation for exploitative purposes. In your case, you were obliged as a very small child yourself to look after children and to basically be a domestic servant. And then you told the relevant authorities, this is not my name. All of those things combined to make the risk that the Home Office would take away your nationality is, is, is lessened. But we don't have a crystal ball, so we want to be absolutely clear that although we think it's a small risk, there is a real risk that that is what will happen. Will this have any impact on my kids and my wife, my family, I guess? It won't have any impact legally for Tanya or your kids. Obviously, it will if they deprive you of your nationality, then sure, as a, a family, that will affect you, but legally, uh, from their position, no, it will not affect them at all. 
it's scary that there would be some risk to most citizenship. There's, there's, there's no hiding it. It's a scary thought. I think we'll just have to see how it goes. Yeah, no. We'll just see what happens. Hi. Hello, Amani. <laughs> how was school? Good. See, did you have your eye on Amani? You all right? Was it school good? Yeah. It is scary, the thought that I'm putting everything at risk. But I need to do this. <laughs> And someone who could help is the woman who took me in, Kinsey. Kinsey is related to the family who brought me into the UK. So she may know the truth about how and why I ended up here. But I've lost contact with her. And then there's my real family back in Somaliland, who were there from the start. I've got some good memories at Somaliland. You know, for us, we lived in the farm with my father. My father's name was Abdi. It was very basic, just farm. All I remember clearly is just being with, with my loved ones. My mom and dad, my brothers, sisters, my twin brother, Hassan, and being their family. When I was four, I was a kid, but we were just out in the farm, normal day. My dad went to look after cattle, um, yeah, and uh, yeah, never came back. And due to the civil war happening between the north and the south, there were a lot of people fighting where he was, and there was a massive bazooka shot. hit the ground, flew into pieces, and one piece hit him on the head and just straight off, off, the, off the head, yeah. And at that point, that was it. And that our life has changed and changed all of us. To me, the hardest thing is, till this day, is like, don't even know what he looked like. This was um, uh, in my room at uni. I would just take as many pictures as I could and then get it developed and then just all, my, all around my room just put pictures, pictures of different memories. You're almost obsessive with taking pictures and then keeping them. And you said to me, because growing up, you never had a picture of your dad. Yeah. Well, growing up as a kid, I did have memories, but I never had any pictures of anyone I was really close to. I think Mo himself hadn't really accepted what had happened to him growing up. The death, the murder even, of your father, and the circumstances of your family being torn apart and you being sent across the world. But he just wasn't ready, and he was able instead to just channel all of that pent-up emotion into his running. It's early 2000, and at this point I'm running for Great Britain. I'm, I'm doing okay. And I think there was a lot of media out there in terms of you know, this young Somali kid who grew up in the UK, he's doing well. I hope a very happy Mohamed Farah winning a silver medal at the European Junior Cross Country Championships. I think that's when people in Somaliland kind of noticed I was in the UK. Can I just say how to all my mates at the uni and that? See you later. <laughs> okay. All yeah. right. All right. See you. I was living with Kinsey and I was just helping out in a restaurant, Somali restaurant, where all the Somali people would come, chat, and there was a lady who lived in the UK. And the lady often saw me there a lot. And this lady comes in, she's like, oh, yeah, I was in Somaliland. I was like, Somaliland? And she's like, what's your name? Mohammed. Okay. What's your real name? And at that point, I think I can kind of talk about it, and it's like, Hussein, what's your mum's name? I uh, told her mum's name, she goes, okay. Well, I saw your mum, I was like, saw my mum? She's alive? And she's like, yeah, she's alive. Here's the photo, so if you don't believe me, if you think I'm a stranger, here's the photo, and then she said, look, 
this is a cassette tape for you. I remember just wanting so badly to get out the restaurant and go to listen to it. It wasn't just a tape, it was more of a, a voice and then they were singing certain songs for me, like poems, or like traditional songs, you know. And I would listen to it for days, weeks. My mum's name is Aisha. I'll never forget my mum on that tape. Lava is the shame of Kala Hada Haval Moyani. Kulbal Kaishogan. Mumba is Kawar Kalane. One Ugadi in Kunori Hai in Grisk. So the tape had a number on it, let's say, or call on the back of it. This is the number. And then I remember you said, if this is a bother or causing you trouble, don't, just leave it. You don't have to contact me. And I'm going, I mean, no, of course I'm going to contact you. And at that point, that's when I first called my mum. I just remember going, Mom. Yeah, she's like, yeah, yeah, you do. Oh, it was Hassan. He's doing good. And I remember that moment was just to know that your mom's okay and she's alive. And they're all okay. For me, it was like, everyone's okay. <laughs> All I wanted to do was to go and see my family out in Somaliland. I saved up enough money. I had quite a lot of hair, shaved my hair because I was scared I would stand out. And then going my first trip, going, I'm going to go and see my brother and my mum. <laughs> the plane took forever. France, France, Djibouti, Djibouti, Somaliland, Hegesa. As I was coming out the plane, I could see my twin brother, Hassan, and just see them alive. At that point, my brother's hugging me, my brother, my brother. I had tears in my eyes. It's been 20 years since that first visit home, and my twin, Hassan, has picked me up from the airport again. I've come back to Somaliland to try and get some answers and to show my son Hussein where I grew up before I had to leave my family. You see that boy just looking after them like cows. My dad was doing exactly the same thing as that when he got killed. And that was the start. We all had to be separated. If it wasn't for that moment, I don't know what life would have been. Would I have become who I am? Would I have gone through what I've gone through in life? Only one person that can tell me on why and how is my mum. We're going to go and see Grandma. Yay! <laughs> We're here at the farm. They're waving me. Hey. It felt amazing. That's my real mom. They are my real brothers. And I think as a kid growing up here, I was just me. And that was my name, that was my twin brother, that's my mom, this is the village. This is the people. This is where I'm from. Yeah. 
After my dad was killed during the civil war, me and Hassan were sent away from the farm to live with relatives across the border in Djibouti. I'm hoping my mom and Hassan and my older brother Faisal can help me understand why I was taken to the UK. Who are you? Tell me Hassan was there. I came to go to the race. I'm an Iman. I'm a slacker. 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 Pada ina anak gue nanti mana ina mau dengi da 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 kakap tadi nanti lagi matang kuki takal aku udah ada air kayu cebut hijau ini yang makah ini saya nak kata biar mau hantu lagi hasan cebut mau lagi man tahu ini oh ya mar ya salah tak kata ina nani cebut kata go antu go Inggris itu ina sih ha ubat ka وأنا أقول لك أنا 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 أقول لك Eh, tenar muka sana baru tu sok ayat itu kos di anjungin tu dua filiri. So di halen yang mana raya ni mana leh yang wayo. Sisi bapak bapak dah bini, hari ni baru gudofi. Makna syah sebab uga itu ina melah cuk tu. Tte kamu berai, mak pun sana. Pahwaran, kaf kau syah gini. Kaf kau syah gini macam ni. Edna. Ah, Edna apa? Maka, mau farah. Kaf kelas kelaha. ما كور ما كشيء ما كرنسا ما كف كخلينا ها ما حنا نو ما كل شيء مسوى حبان كرنا يا أنا كايج وما فوق يرى أنا كو إما كألاني ما كقول كان كوي ما تيجي كل وربا كايج وما أنا كو يرى حسين بان كو هو قلنا لي كو هو ما قاعد بيجي حسين عبدك هاي ما ها عبد وحنا نروش أي كشيء كنا يا لقي يا بنو حويني سهوي حاملني سين تو فرحة وين بيتها يا الله إنا يروح قبط Allah When I told him there will be a risk me doing this, they kind of understood and he says it's the truth. It is what it is. You are who you are. There's no denying that. It was very important for me and my son to see my dad's grave and pray for him. My father named me Hussein. And I know over the years my name's changed, but my father never knew anything. That's the name he and my mom decided. And it was important to me to carry on the name. So my son, I named him Hussein. Before I leave Africa, there's one more place I want to show Hussein. This street in Djibouti is where I was sent after my father's death. It's from here that I was taken to the UK. All right, let's go. I will show you. This is where I used to live, Hussein. This is the house. Salam alaikum. It's the first time I've been back to this house since I was nine years old. And the people who live here say that my relatives left a long time ago. 
this gentleman now owns it for you. Yeah, yeah, his aunt used to own the house. At the time when we were living here, which I didn't know, I thought we owned it, but we didn't. We were renting it off his family. Wow. I guess I was so young at the time, it's difficult in my mind to know exactly what's happened, really. But being in this house, I do remember some things very clear. The idea came for me to go out to Europe and live with my relatives. I, I, I never questioned that. I was like, yeah, excited, and that's when it all began. Remember, this lady turns up my house. Don't know who she is, but obviously, the family knew her somehow. Remember her coming to the house a few times, kind of looking at me, what I do, what, I'm, what I look like. And then later on, my family going, yeah, you're going to go with this lady. She's got two kids. You're going to go to, to Europe. But when you go there, your name is Mohammed. And I remember going, what? Is my real name going to change? As, as a kid, you never even think beyond what you've been told. Never thought in a minute, you're going to go with a stranger and be stuck there. And the hardest thing is admitting to myself that someone from my own family may have been involved in trafficking me. I think that thought has been at the back of my mind for a long, long time. But I've never really spoken about any of these till now. Okay, how are you? You okay? Yeah, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. When I was nine years old, brought to the UK, the completely different name, not the name was given to me by, by my parents, kept in the house, taking care of other kids as well. That could potentially fit um, a type of trafficking called domestic servitude. And domestic servitude is a type of forced labour, yeah. but it's forced labour in someone's home. Um, and it's really, really tricky to identify it because it happens behind closed doors. Yeah. What's the long-term effect on this? Do you ever get over it? Or will it always just be there? Wow, that's a big question. But I think the very fact that you're starting to think about these things 20, 30 years after they've happened shows that it's a long and complicated journey. And Sometimes with potential victims, they feel guilty as well because they feel like they were part of it. Well, I said yes to travelling or I said yes to the job or... And, and so there are lots of their kind of processes dealing with the fact that actually they were taken advantage of and it wasn't their fault at all. I don't know, part of me is like, I didn't know any better and you're just a child, you're going, you go on the other side, you get excited and I remember being very, very excited and couldn't wait, couldn't sleep. And then you go and then three or four months later you rock bottom. I know I'm, I'm almost 40 but <laughs> it's been so, so long in my mind and, and it's scary to go public with this. I think it is incredibly brave because I think we do live in a, a hostile environment where the issues of trafficking and smuggling and illegal immigration all kind of get conflated. Last year in the UK over 10,000 potential victims of trafficking were identified um, and that's the tip of the iceberg. The real numbers might be up to 100,000 potential victims. So for you to come forward will hopefully challenge people's perceptions of what slavery and trafficking is and who it might happen to. Yeah. I had no idea there were so many people who are going through exactly the same thing that I did. It just shows how lucky I was. So many moments in my life where it could have gone this way or that way. But what really saved me, what made me different, was that I could run. So to the much anticipated men's 5,000 meter Final. 2012 was such a huge year. I remember thinking, gosh, it's, this is all or nothing. This is something he's dreamed about since he was a kid. And there's Mo Farah. What sort of race will it be? 
Kane. Being out on the running field is a way of, for me, having two separate lives, if that makes sense. Mo Farah looks very comfortable. He's got the basic speed. But you have that moment where you just do what you do. Mo Farah's looking to go, and with just three laps to go, it's now going to be a real race. You know, the noise in the stadium was just remarkable. And I was sitting almost with my head in my hands, watching through my fingers. The big kick has started, but Mo Farah gritting his teeth now. Alan and I both knew what had gone into getting Mo to that point, what he'd been through as a kid, as a very young child. The arms have got to pump, the knees have got to come up high. He's got to find something extra. It's going to be a cracking last 100 metres. I was in bits, I was crying. I knew the story, and the story was just a crazy, ridiculous story that you couldn't make up. He's got to kick hard. Come on, Mo Farah. Gabriel Maskell is coming, but I think he's going to get there. Farah is going to make it two gold medals for Great Britain. Beautiful. The place he rocks. He's the double Olympic champion. Yeah, the enormity of it was just difficult to comprehend. Wonderful, wonderful double. After 2012, my life changed. Suddenly, I wasn't Mo. I was Mo, the boy who'd won two Olympic gold medals in front of his hometown. The press getting involved. Well, who is he? What does he do? Where's his family? I was doorstepped by the mirror and the sun, who both came to me to find out where had this boy come from, what's his story. And the hardest things for me, just not being honest. Because you came to the UK from Somalia when you yeah, were eight? Eight years old, yeah. Just remember being excited and, you know, seeing my dad was a big part for me. It was just going there. And I was just excited to come off the plane, met him. And... You know, you're a role model and it's a, it's a wonderful thing for the country. <laughs> In my mind, I don't think I was ever ready to say anything. Not because you want to lie, but because you're protecting yourself. I think you only realise later on down the line, it's OK to let things out and say how it happened. So what do you think happened? I never like to see anything bad or anything. Like, I always try and turn into a positive or have a positive spin on it and go, oh, no, that's not what it is. But in this, I, I think Leo was trafficked, and that's what it feels like. The question is, will we ever get the truth? I mean, we've got some information that gives us an idea, but someone that might be able to help give us some insight, who is connected to, to a lot of this, is Kinsey. Yeah. Not going to be easy speaking to Kinsey, because I've not spoke to her for many, many years. But I think she will have a lot of answers if she's willing to talk to me. It's definitely worth trying. Yeah. Kinsey is um, my aunt. I call her my aunt. Uh, it's a respect. But really, she's not my aunt. She's the sister of the man who was waiting for me at the airport. And the sister-in-law of the lady who brought me to the UK. A time where things were really difficult for me. Kinsey is, is, is that one person who took me un, under her wing and, and welcomed me to her house. I lost contact with Kinsey. Maybe there's part of me wanted not to know what went on or how it happened. I've been hiding this for over 20 years. But the other side of it, it's like, I want to know why was I brought to the UK in the name of another child, a boy called Mohammed Farah. And Kinsey's the aunt of the other Mohammed Farah. It's taken a long time to get back in contact with Kinsey. But today, finally, I'm meeting her and her family. And I hope she's got some answers. Hi, 
Who's that boy there? <laughs> oh my days. Well, you don't mind going blonde again, do you? If I had hair, I would. We're so happy today to see you. Welcome to the family again. Thank you. It's been difficult uh, to understand why did I come to the UK and there's no one else but other than you who maybe can help. My brother, he went to the Heathrow Airport. He said he's going to collect his children and his wife and you come back with my brother and we shocked. Then I said, who is this boy? Because I know my brother's yeah. son, how he look. You, do, you don't look like him. No. Then the lady said, um, this boy, his family, they all died. The father, the mother, the sisters, the brothers, they all died. And everyone feels sorry for you and we give you love and we accept you how you are. Yeah. Do you know why the lady brought me under a different name? Not really. And when we ask her, who is this boy, she tell us, this boy, he don't have no one else. That's why I bring him here. That's it. Then, I saw you always, you know, happy. You crying. Then I try to find out what's going on with you. The lady, she always uh, make you to do the housework, to have the kids, to, to give them the milk, to change the napkin, all these things. Do you think that was her reason when she brought me to UK, helping her, cooking, cleaning? I don't know. But what I know, she didn't bring you as a human being no. to help you, no. You call me to say you in the front of the house with the social services. Yeah. Then they told me, uh, do you know this boy? I said, yes. He said, this woman, she brought it in this country. She's not his mother. I say, yes, he's not. Then they ask me, you his aunt? I say, yes, I'm his aunt. You going to have him? I say, yes, I'm going to have him. Yeah. From that uh, night, you with us. Social services thought you were my aunt, but you weren't really. You were just there. Yeah, I'm not your aunt, me. but you got my brother's uh, name. Yeah. And your child. You need someone to protect you. No, for sure. I yeah. Even myself, I remember this. And uh, if I tell you the truth, this is not your fault. This yeah. name is gift. Allah gives to you, and they bring you here with that name, and you went up and up and up and up and up. But still, it's good to have your real name. Yeah. Another thing is always that, like, I don't know, in my mind, mm. and I, I think about it. Mm. What happened to that other Mohammed Farah? Has he ever been to the UK before, yeah. Mohammed? Never. He didn't come at all. Uh, do, you, do you keep in touch? Do you know where he is? How he's doing? We lost contact. Then I find his fa Facebook. Yeah. Then we speak several times. He give us his uh, WhatsApp number. Yeah. We, if you want, we call him now. Okay. And you talk to him. Is it a surprise or no? All I had is a surprise. <laughs> That's the surprise I have for you. <laughs> just, just emotional because I don't know, you lived for so long with this and you don't know what happened to him. He's waiting for us now. Okay. That's a good surprise. Yeah. He's the cute. Eddo. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum. Sparta, why didn't Kenna Sparta? Mohammed. How are you? How are you? Well, no matter, it's covering. Well, I can't believe I'm speaking to you. I carry your name, and for many, many years I've been, I carry that with me. And, and, and I'm proud of you know, what I have achieved. But as a person, I always wonder where's, where's Mohammed? Where, is he okay? What, what would life been like for him? 
I think about it all the time, and I, in person, I just wanted to get in touch and to see how you're doing. Are you happy? Do you have family, you have kids, you're married? No, not yet, not yet. Okay. It's, it's hard to say everything, but... Yeah, I can see. It's okay, just talk, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen me run? I saw you only on television. <laughs> okay. Are you any good at running or...? Me? No, no, no. <laughs> are, you, are you a football fan? Arsenal fan, Arsenal. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay then. We're okay. Are you allowed to travel to the UK? Am I allowed? Yes. I don't think so. I would love to come to UK. I would personally like to meet you. I will try my best to make that happen. Inshallah. I just want to say one thing to you. Thank you so much. Um, I use your name. I, I came here as a child and I just want to say thank you. And, and it, it was, it's been hard, difficult. It's okay. You're still my brother. Yeah. Wow. Okay, bye bye. Well, I love you. Call me, I'll do number kind. You will, bye bye. Take a look after yourself and, and thank you. And I mean it, I mean it. I don't even know what to say. It felt amazing, feel like relief. I didn't get the answer that I was looking for. Why was I brought over here? I still don't know, but most importantly for me today, the answer I got that relief from Mohammed saying, you're still my brother. And for me, I couldn't ask for a better thing. I feel like something has been lifted off of my shoulders, but that's just me. I don't know how everyone's going to see it. Are you worried about what people will think? People who love me and cares, like my mom, Kinsey, told me it's okay to say my real name. I'm starting to understand me. Me. Not Mohammed Farah. Me. Hussein Abdi Kahin.